Look at him, he's a vile pervert, ogling boys and lifting his shirt, looking at girls and rolling in dirt. Ooh, he's a vile pervert, look at him, he's a vile pervert, don't be fooled by his winning smile, get your shoes on, run a mile, he's a pervert and he's vile. It doesn't matter what he's doing, when he's thinking something sick He will look at someone innocent, and destroy them with his pick He will poison every flower, with the filth of his condition And will always select kinky, over missionary position Look at him, he's a vile pervert, ogling boys and lifting his shirt Looking at girls and rolling in dirt Ooh, he's a vile pervert He's a vile pervert, don't be fooled by his winning smile Get your shoes on, run a mile He's a pervert and he is vile He'll look sweet and charming, open-minded, fresh and cute But the depth of his depravity is far beyond dispute Just because he's good and decent, see behind it, don't be fooled He is grooming, sex is looming, from the second that you're schooled Look at him, he's a vile pervert, ogling boys and lifting his shirt Looking at girls and rolling in dirt, ooh He's a vile pervert, look at him He's a vile pervert, don't be fooled by his winning smile Get your shoes on, run a mile He's a pervert and he's vile, look at him He's a vile pervert, ogling boys and lifting his shirt Look at that girls and rolling in dirt Ooh, he's a vile pervert, look at him He's a vile pervert, don't be fooled by his winning smile It all started, as so many things do, with the celebrated, notorious public relations person, Waxy Maxi. Let me put you on hold, I'll only be a minute. So, let's see, what's your name? Kurt. C-U-R-R-T. Well, let's hear all about you. Before you start a little about myself, I never approach anyone. All my clients come to me as you have done. That way I can claim never to have set anything up. And secondly, everything you tell me must be true. That way I can honestly claim I believed you. And between us we can make lots and lots of money. I'm very successful, very rich. I'm also kind, sweet, generous and loyal. You may not believe it, but they call me the Silver Stout. You may not believe me, but they call him the Silver Stout. With his thick white hair and his slippery tongue, he's more of a snake than a goat. And you may not believe them, but he claims to think it's true. Though he could be a lie to cover his tracks in case they decide to sue. And ooh, he's gonna screw you. Ooh, sticking it to you. He's gonna do what it pays him to do until his life is through. They may not believe him in his tabloid position of strength, but they can buy his stories conveniently at arm's length. And you may not believe him when he helps the police and press to convict all the innocent victims with headline of pain and distress. And ooh, he's gonna screw you. Who's thinking it to you? He's gonna do what it pays him to do until. As he sucks on Satan's bile But the evil he disseminates Is absolutely vile And you may not believe him With the poison that he spread But everyone he's ever cared for Has ended up crippled or dead And ooh, he's gonna screw you Ooh, sticking it to you He's gonna do what he pays him to do Until his life is through He's gonna do what he pays him to do Until his life is through He's gonna do what he pays him now let me tell you straight off, 
you have no story. Oh, I understand your life has been traumatic, uh, being a drug addict junkie, a liar, a rent boy, prostitute, alcoholic and failure. None of that is actually a problem as we routinely blame it all on the abuse instead of the other way around, which would make you rather unreliable. Uh, you've reached the age of 50. What's your name again? Kurt, spelt C-U-R-T. As I was saying, these men you were abused by back in the uh, 60s and 70s, and I must believe everything you tell me, you understand, and who are therefore responsible for the appalling state of your life, they're little people, unimportant, trivial. Yes, one of them used to be a radio DJ years ago, but everyone has forgotten him. Local papers might do a story, but there's no money in that. Sad though it may be, if it's money you're after, you won't get it unless there's a celebrity involved. Fame equals cash. Remember that, Carl. That's the important thing. Fame. Nothing else matters. But with fame comes huge profits, up to £33,000 in compensation, which need not be declared for tax or to anyone else, and anonymity remains for the claimants. Six-figure sums from the tabloids, if the stories are particularly salacious, minus my 20% deduction, of course. Remember, they pay nothing, or only hundreds, for stories about non-entities, but tens of thousands for celebrities. Thank you so much for approaching me. Goodbye. I must take this call. Nothing can beat being a professional victim. Making you richer today Claiming a crime from decades ago Everyone believes what you say Nothing can beat being a professional victim A sob in your voice and a tear in your eye Revenge or delusion The world's at your feet when you break down and cry Who can disprove your terrible story After all it was so long ago You truly deserve all the cash compensation The sympathy and attention that come from high and low Nothing can beat being a professional victim Cause no one could doubt your pain And if they do, you'll relate it again and again It needn't be ancient if you say it just happened And it's only their word against yours You'll discover a legion of organizations specializing in opening doors with new laws. Nothing can beat being a professional victim. Brush cynics away like dead flies. And the genuine victims can suffer in silence from your lies. That bastard DJ used to work for him. Who? Jonathan King? Yeah, he worked for him for a short time after he was a DJ. King used to come down to that disco I used to go to. That's where he got the idea for that big hit he had. Remember Johnny Reggae? Johnny Reggae? Never heard of it. Yeah, you remember. He's grown his hair a bit, but it's smooth, not too long. What's he like, Mavis? He's a real tasty geezer. What's he like, Mavis? He's a real tasty geezer. He's grown his ear a bit, but it's smooth, not too long. And he wears a baseball shirt with a number 17 on. He looks great in his big white basketball boots. He's stupid over football and he looks me in the eye when he shoots. Reggae, reggae, reggae. Here comes Johnny Reggae. Johnny Reggae, reggae, lay it on me. Reggae, reggae, reggae. Here comes Johnny Reggae. Johnny Reggae, reggae, lay it on me. He'll always start a fight for me. He's always on the phone. Two-tone tonic strides 
reggae, reggae. Here comes Johnny Reggae. Johnny Reggae, reggae, lay it on me. Reggae, reggae, reggae. Here comes Johnny Reggae. Johnny Reggae, reggae, lay it on me. Reggae, reggae, reggae. Here comes Johnny Reggae. Christ on Corcovado to Jonathan King. Rio de Janeiro is indeed a city of contrasts, and Brazil is the largest Roman Catholic state in the world. It's also the eighth biggest economy. Hold on a moment. If he's famous and you met him... But I never did meet him. If you had met him, he might have abused you. And if he'd abused you, I'm sure Waxy Maxy might be interested because he's a celebrity. And if he's interested, there could be a load of money in it for him as well as for us. We could be rich beyond our wildest dreams. And he would be rich as well. I'm sure Waxy Maxy would be interested. Remember, there's no proof needed. It's just your word against his. Here, give him a call! So Kurt and Mrs Kurt put their heads together and perfected a story and checked all the details. And then Kurt called Waxy Maxy, who rubbed his hands together with glee and said that Kurt must go immediately to the police and make an official complaint of abuse from 30 years ago with all the details to back his story up because Waxy Maxy knew that the one thing about a scandal that made lots and lots of money was celebrity. That led to publicity and lots of other people jumping on the bandwagon. Waxy Maxy knew one thing about life today. Celebrity means a brand and a brand means profits. I hate Coca-Cola and I hate Pepsi too. Flavouring with chemicals and an aftertaste of glue. I hasten to say this is just my opinion. I really have no idea what's in them. But if you want to love them, that's okay. I wouldn't have it any other way. Like what you like, that's fine. I'll allow your tastes, you respect mine. I hate McDonald's and Burger King the same. The only thing I like about them is their second name. I hate terrorists who think that God exists. I hate governments locking up for suspicion, justifying their position with a different religion. I hate Jesus Christ, and I hate Allah too. I hate all organized structure that tells us what to do. Are quite entitled to believe anything you like That's okay with me I'll defend your right to worship anyone you choose Except if it means stepping on someone else's shoes I hate people who go on about hating They are so occupied with negating It gets frustrating like moral masturbating I hate all branding And all grandstanding it's everywhere you see I hate all writers So proud dictating In the name of art and music Pretending to be debating I hate me I hate you Sometimes I'm so busy hating I've got no time for drinking Coca-Cola
Well, you can imagine my astonishment when Surrey police came knocking at my door. Notice the front door colour, the police did, on a rainy, dull Thursday morning, telling me that I'd been accused of sex offences from over 30 years ago. My first feeling was that it was all a silly mistake and it would all be thrown out in a few seconds. My lawyer confirmed this when he read all the statements and said, there's not a chance in hell that you'll be charged with any of this, just before I was. Then they took my DNA, Bango's my planned Alzheimer's shoplifting spree for my old age, and I was charged. Well, my first feeling was that was the end of my career, my life and my world. Then after a few minutes, I thought, no, just the parameters have changed. It's a new direction, another big adventure. I'd never really come into contact with either the police or crime before in my life. I thought it was something that happened to other people and quite often in another country. Wherever there's sort of poverty, and there's plenty of poverty in Rio, you're going to get a very empty crime rate. Uh, but most of the crime, at least the crime is, is, that, that affects tourists here, uh, they're, they're what they call the beach rats, so the boys who run along snatch your gold chain or your watch and stuff like that. Mind you, there's also uh, a lot of crimes that take place in the favelas. The favelas are the slums of Rio, where the, the poor coloured people live, and most of the, the deaths uh, are disputes over women, over drugs. Uh, they have like points where you can buy marijuana and so forth, and then they dispute these points and wind, wind up killing each other for them, etc. Uh, but really, uh, Crime is, well, I think it's overrated, or they, the way they talk about crime in this country is, it's not so bad as one might imagine. It's a very, very densely populated city, and uh, I don't think the crime rate here is as high as it's made out to be. There were two things against me. I'd always been openly bisexual to all my friends in a time when, don't forget, homosexuality was completely illegal until 1967 and then only legal between people if you were both over 21. So everything had to be kept completely and totally secret. In those days, uh, we both enjoyed ourselves. They wanted to go with me then, and I wanted to go with them then. They probably wouldn't want to go with me now, but I wouldn't want to go with them now either. Secondly, I'd always relied on personal contact, both to make and break my hit. So I spoke to everyone and had thousands of people come to my house, the vast majority for completely non-sexual reasons. But of course, I was building up a potential vast bank of false accusers, which I didn't even think of. I was far too friendly at the time as a young teenager back in 1965. of people all alone roads full of houses never home church full of singing out of tune everyone's gone to the moon Full of sorrow, never wait. Hands full of money, all in debt. Sun coming out in the middle of June. Everyone's gone to the moon. Long time ago, life had begun. Everyone went to the sun. Hearts full of motors, painted green. Mouths full of chocolate, covered cream. Arms that can only lift a spoon Everyone's gone to the moon Everyone's gone 
to the moon Everyone's gone to the moon That was his first hit back in 1965. Then he had loads more. Sugar, sugar, it's the same old song. It only takes a minute, girl. Loop de love, lazy bones, hooked on a feeling. Una Paloma Blanca, the sun has got his hat on, all under different names. I don't remember any of them, but one thing is for sure, now we've started this, loads of others will come forward and make ours look genuine. It's called trawling by media. And they were quite right. Police disclosure later revealed that one man now in his 60s came forwards and said that 40 years ago King had offered him a lift in his car and he'd refused it. Imagine going to the police with that. He then, of course, asked if there was any money in this. The police sent him away with a flea in his ear, but many other allegations were taken more seriously. In this day and age, you are guilty unless and until you can prove your innocence. And then there's the chaos theory. Don't forget, a butterfly can flap his wings in Great Britain, and a tsunami can be caused in Asia. It's a jungle out there. It's a jungle out there. to go home there were two policemen smoking cigarettes outside and they said to me JK we hate what's going on but it's out of our control there was clearly something bigger going on here than just the prosecution of a silly old queen then something else struck me the police were not looking for the truth they were just looking to get a conviction as I gather they frequently do when this dawned on me it was the greatest shock of all well, Hugo, what do you remember about that incident 16 years ago? For example, what colour was his front door? Blue! 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 I remember his front door was painted blue! That was when it suddenly struck me. Going through all the statements, I decided I must have gone mad. 
these events must have happened and I must have simply forgotten about them until I read the piece that the front door was bright blue. My front door had been painted white for its entire life for the last hundred years and we found the painter and decorator and he came to court and swore that until about a year or so ago. How on earth could somebody who hadn't visited or seen my house for 16 years have known that the front door was now bright blue unless... I went back through all the earlier statements that I'd read previously and I could see the points again and again where there might have been assistance. For example, to a man that I'd never even met. Can you remember whether he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Circumcised! I remember he was definitely circumcised! 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 No wonder the jury tends to believe it when unconnected people say the same thing. It's beyond their belief that it could just be a coincidence and I have to say it would have been beyond mine. I'm not saying the police did this and I don't think it's malice. I'm not saying there's corruption or nastiness going on. I just think they have to keep their numbers up and they've got targets to meet. They're taught lock them up and gloss over even if they're innocent. Put it this way, the threshold of doubt is easily crossed. Sex claims are easy to win convictions. Despite rumours to the contrary, most that come to court actually get found guilty. Let's be honest, we're brought up to seek humour, intelligence, grace, decency and wisdom, but when it comes to the chase, all that counts is the body and the face. One girl is cute, one has top grade passes A great personality, buck teeth and glasses Incredibly bright but incredibly thin With frizzy hair and terrible skin Nobody wants the plain friend Nobody wants the plain friend You pretend to defend qualities you depend on But they go home alone in the end One boy is built like an Olympic athlete With pecs and muscles and wings on his feet the other is nice and loyal and fat Do you really want to be involved with that? Nobody wants the plain friend Nobody wants the plain friend You pretend to defend the qualities you depend on But they go home alone One lady is frivolous, gorgeous and flirty A Venus de Milo whose morals are dirty The other is sweet and behaves like a nun She knows how to pray but not how to have fun Nobody wants the plain friend, nobody wants the plain friend You pretend to defend qualities you depend on But they go home alone one guy is handsome and brimming with brawn The other will chatter from sunset till dawn The one with the brain is so stimulating But he's not the one you end up dating Nobody wants the plain friend Nobody wants the plain friend You pretend to defend qualities you depend on But they go home alone in the end Nobody wants the plain friend Nobody wants the plain friend You pretend to defend the judge decided to throw out many of the false claims when we proved that the men would have been over 16 when they happened and he also divided the case into several trials. Since then I've decided that might have been a mistake. The jury might well have acquitted me seeing so many of the men were either proven liars or had made mistakes. As it happens, I eventually only had two trials and the judge ordered the outstanding claims abandoned. Actually, the prosecution only needed one trial to screw me. Some claims were allowed to lie on file. Interesting legal term, that. If they lied in court, lied in the media and lied in their statements, why not lie on file? It's a legal euphemism for throwing a claim out. I later learned that lawyers tend to advise most clients accused of sex crimes simply to plead guilty and get a shorter sentence because a jury will nearly always convict them. Facing false allegations Don't seek felicitations Or good prognostications 
they won't be Your legal expectations will bypass all the stations Defying good relations, just you see You may have done no wrong, your morals may be strong You'll want to scream and shout and let it all hang out But I am warning you, the verdict's never true Whatever you do, plead guilty The sentence will be big Unless he comes up with a solution Does deal with prosecution The judge in restitution Will bow to prostitution And you'll go almost free That's how the law will be Whatever you do Plead guilty Jonathan started to move into a new world, a world populated by criminals, police, judges, and those awful people, lawyers. The French word for lawyer is avocat, surprisingly the same as avocado pear, which is appropriate. Both are full of fat, taste of soap, and have pale, wrinkled green skin. This man is a vile pervert. He's been behaving absolutely disgracefully all his life. Ignore the fact that he says he was looking for promotion and ways to discover new hit records. If that was a way of getting hit records, why wasn't everybody doing it? Look at the similarities in all the stories of the complainant. And ignore the fact that the police may have assisted them with details here and there. Ignore the fact that actually they mainly deal with how they met, listened to records, got opinions and did all those ordinary normal sort of things. 99%. And ignore the fact that the 1% is completely different in many ways. That doesn't matter. Most of all, you need to convict this man because of one thing. It's a good story. That's the only thing that matters to me. If it's a good story, I get a conviction. That's the only thing that matters to the judge. If he gets a conviction, he's not a loony lefty, and he's got a good conviction. But most of all, that's what matters to the media. They have to have a good story. And Mr King being guilty is a great story. Now, here is the defence. I didn't do it. What a lousy story. I didn't do it. No headlines in that. The press left the gallery in disgust and the jury yawned in boredom after the fabulous, salacious, shocking, terrible story of the prosecution case. That had been a great story. We even mentioned King's seduction packs. Actually, they were these, Concord travel packs. When the judge asked us, in that case, why hadn't we seized any of these seduction packs to show to the jury as evidence, we were a bit embarrassed. No jury would have convicted if they had actually examined them, but seduction packs had been mentioned, and though struck off, the seeds were planted in the jury's poor little bored brain. 
You may have noticed that it's standard judicial procedure for the judge at a trial to instruct the jury to put something out of their minds, such as publicity in the media. The jury know that's impossible, you know that's impossible, the judge knows that's impossible, so the lawyers do it again and again. It's all part of the glorious dishonesty of the British judicial trial system. As Jonathan used to say, and later converted the whole of Belmarsh Prison to saying, quite a feat when the place was packed with uh, serial killers, terrorists and mass murderers, what's a girl to do? Ooh la la la, sha la la la, hey la la la, gorry la la. When I saw you standing at the bar I knew you were going to be a star Something told me we would go far That was then, now here we are Things don't always go quite as planned Sometimes a singer's out of time with the band I looked in your eyes, I held on to your hand And sadly knew where we stand I was bemused when, having managed to prove that I could not have committed four of the six crimes alleged in the time frames that were on the indictment, the prosecution asked, and the judge allowed, for the dates to be changed to later time frames, always later, in one case two and a half years later. I wanted to say I didn't do it then either, but I wasn't allowed to put forward a single word in my alternative defence. Can you imagine, having managed to prove you didn't do something in the whole of 1983, the date gets changed to 1984 without you being allowed to find out what you were doing in 1984? Your Honour. And I do think you're a wonderful judge. Since Mr King has managed to prove that he cannot have committed the crimes during the year-long time frame specified in several of the charges on the indictment, is it all right with you if we alter the time frames and the dates on those charges on the indictment in one case to two and a half years later? Yes, that is standard judicial procedure. The jury will be sent out without being given a single shred of evidence for the new time frames or dates. Mr King will not even be allowed to say a single word in his defence like, I didn't do it then either. Now I know that sounds incredibly unfair, but I have to tell you it happens all the time. It's not when something occurred that matters, but whether it occurred. 
So how would we manage to prove that I didn't do something during an entire year? Can you believe that? Say 1983 and I can prove I didn't do something in 1983. Well, one man claimed he was a huge fan of my TV series No Limits and that's what he'd come up to me and raved about. We could prove that No Limits wasn't broadcast until a year later. And another man claimed that I had given him a photograph that was taken, we proved, three years later than he claimed he'd given it by me. Now, incidentally, I never met that man. So, in that case, how did he get hold of that photograph? All I can say is that when the police raided my home... The police seized several copies of that photograph. Draw your own conclusions. By the way, the only time I've ever had my credit card copied and cloned was a few weeks after the police searched my house. Suddenly, out of the blue, £30,000 was charged to my credit card in Paris. So new dates, all much later than the original date, were placed on the indictment instead of the ones that I defended myself on. Since I've been released from prison, I've discovered that actually, during one of the later time frames, I was in New York, on a totally different continent. So I cannot have actually committed the crime that I was convicted of. But all that happened later. At the time, I wasn't given a second to work out my alternative defence. You have been found guilty by a jury of your peers, 12 men and women who are all celebrities, used to the spotlight of the media, rolling in cash and having dozens of hit records, so they can judge you fair and square as an equal. Even though these crimes are relatively trivial, I shall give you an enormously lengthy prison sentence in order to avoid being called a loony lefty by the tabloids and to give bigger and better headlines to my friends in the media. Seven years of hell and hard labour. Take him down. So down I went and the next stage of the adventure began. I met many fascinating characters in prison. Some of them were completely guilty as convicted, and many of them were actually quite decent human beings despite their crimes. Some were totally innocent poor souls and had been stitched up by somebody or other, but the vast majority were guilty of lesser crimes than they'd been convicted for in order to get much better headlines, stories, media coverage, convictions, and of course, longer sentences. <laughs> As a 
editor of one of the biggest tabloid newspapers, I was of course delighted to be able to paint as a monster, a celebrity who found teenagers attractive. Since most of our circulation is boosted by carrying photographs of naked teenage girls, we do like to appeal to the more homophobic element of our readership, who think people who find teenage boys are attractive are repellent. Two tits good, two balls bad. And we love misinterpreting stories. Anybody who's in prison, we can say anything we like about with impunity. They are, of course, locked up and have no reputation whatsoever to lose. We get great pleasure in depicting lyrics like the true story of Harold Shipman say that they think he's innocent which of course they don't. Instead of saying that they think the media inflate and colour stories, which of course we do. Mind you, we need to be careful. For ten years King wrote a weekly page for this very newspaper, so he knows where all the bodies are buried. We don't want to annoy him too much, or he might let our readers know. In fact, we paid him several thousand pounds a week, and if he had in fact been guilty of the offences he was convicted of, we would have paid for them. He's seen all the hardcore pornography on the screens of our computers in our office, in front of the journalists, of course, all there only for research purposes. Animals, children, rapists, bestiality, sadists, and that's just the journalists. Men are such wimps. My husband comes across as a tough guy. Actually, he's an actor. The only way he can ever get a hard on is if I beat the shit out of him. We all diligently avoided printing the exact words of Judge Trial. However... Must I? Oh, very well. I accept that no violence, coercion or threats were used. I accept that the evidence of those complainants was that you desisted when they expressed unhappiness and that there was no cruelty. I further accept that the precise ages of the complainants were very difficult to assess. King's appalling crimes would of course have been perfectly legal in Spain, Italy, Germany, Austria, Bulgaria, Croatia, France, Czechoslovakia, Denmark, Hungary, Sweden. Well, you get the message. Gay sex was made legal in Spain in 1822. In the United Kingdom in 1967, as long as you were over 21. It always bemuses me how much people are prepared to believe what they read and see in the media whilst they're busily pretending that they don't. And I'm also amazed by how much people underestimate my arch enemy, Lucifer. Jonathan found himself in prison with some of the sort of people who would be normally regarded as the mainstay of a healthy society. Preachers, teachers, vicars, priests, uh, foster parents, care workers, social workers, all the people who, if Satan really wanted to destroy all affection, kindness and love for children in society, he would lock up in prison. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for attending my annual talk on policy and spending. Tonight I unveil Lucifer's new tools for ridding the world of this species of fools. Children! Children! We'll seduce their souls and empty their hearts. We'll create an army of poison darts. By removing caring and loving and learning, we'll turn them into zombies of hatred and yearning. They'll become adults so empty and shallow that wombs will turn sterile and fields remain fallow. Deploy them! Destroy them! Forget the black plague, AIDS and host of diseases. This is more effective and kills all its seizes. It sucks out humanity, sowing depravity. It vacuums gravity and nurtures insanity. You won't believe the power so strong in persuading the young that love is wrong. We'll create a sin of affection. We'll make them empty husks with our direction. We'll stamp them underfoot with our subjection. We'll pretend it's protection and ban the very mention of the word erection. Teach 
teachers, foster parents, doctors, priests, everyone who cares most and hates the very least, will turn them into monsters, depict them as beasts, strip down their reputation to eat them at our feasts. The noblest professions debased, refugees for the confused erased. This is brilliant! Devastation! Annihilation! The final ending of humanity! The lethal blow to God's mad vanity! Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my excellent production! Satan's ultimate weapon of mass distraction! Adolf Hitler circumcised or uncircumcised? Prison life was fascinating. I was astonished and horrified by how many inmates cannot even read or write, I'd say 50% of them. Generally, of course, it's very boring. One inmate kept going to the showers and the officers couldn't work out why until they discovered in his room that he had a vast collection of pubic hairs, ranging in style from completely black at one end to completely white at the other end. Barking mad! There's an undercurrent of anger in prison too. Prisoners are not even allowed to wear t-shirts supporting their favourite football teams in case it starts a nasty argument. Well, the key sport has always been, uh, always been football, you know, ever since, uh, well, you know, everyone knows who Pelé was, so I won't talk about other football stars. But, uh, you know, even on any street corner, wherever you go in Rio, where there's a, where there's a vacant lot or you know, an empty space of any kind, You'll see a bunch of kids have got a football there and they're and they're playing. Football is really the sport, the, on, the only sport in Brazil. This has been one of the most shocking cases I have ever encountered. Shocking because I keep using words like vehicule and apprehended that only occur in cop speak and do not exist in the real world. Shocking because my delivery is as wooden as the words are stupid. Shocking because this pathetic little man gets a kick out of appearing on courtroom steps all over the world and making identical statements like this, which are recorded on video so that he can watch them in his retirement in a bungalow home on the south coast of Great Britain. But most shocking of all, because I'm only ever photographed from the waist up, whereas I'm actually far more interesting from the waist down. Back in 63 I was 18 years old, hoping to become a rock and roll star, looking for pay dirt, celebrity gold, to become an idol with or without. I knew I could go far The finest producer in the whole UK Was an old man called Joe Meek He was gifted and confused and bright and gay He was the man I'd seek I reckon he'd give me a hit in a week He wrote and produced Telstar, you see And the honeycombs have I the right And Leighton's Johnny remember me And made Heights a star overnight Surely he could do the same for me Screw me. He loved Barry and Holly. His sound was weird, compressed and muddy. With echoing sound, he'd like a madman's folly. He said he thought I looked like Buddy. He put an old mic rack in foam on the boards to give him a thudding that moved him more. He did all this to the tune and the chords. He stood in the bath and he stamped on the floor. He stood in the bath and he stamped on the floor. They never came out or turned into smashes, but joined declined and his story turned sadder. His life and times became ashes. Slowly, madder and madder.
murder A tragic end, sadder and madder He shot his landlady and then himself and died A bankrupt, lonely guy My fading tape fell apart on his shelf I have nothing to remember him by But his magic music still gets me high This song is for the big man Joe A producer I was proud to know Knocked over by a moral blow But he was a major part of our music show He stood in the bath and he stamped on the floor He stood in the bath and he stamped on the floor He stood in the bath and he stamped on the floor In order to simplify matters, I was persuaded to divide this case into several trials. King was found guilty in the first, and we had to wait six weeks to avoid jury contamination before the second trial. Locked up in Belmarsh Jail, it wasn't easy for me preparing my defence for the second trial. However, I got a friend to go round to my house and search through my belongings, and sure enough, he found a record which proved that one of the men who I'd never even met had to have been three or four years older than he claimed because the record he said I played at a disco when he first saw me was actually recorded several years later than he said. We proved that through label copy and so on. OK, so I wasn't 15, I was 18 or 19. What's the difference? It was an awful experience and I hated it. I also proved another man who I had met was far older than he claimed because we had a photograph of him standing in front of a piece of artwork in my house that we could prove had not been manufactured until three or four years later. The first man, who I never met, when he claimed he'd been up to my house many times and was asked why, said, Because I enjoyed myself. There's a clause in the old 1967 Act legalising homosexuality for the over-21s that says if both parties were over 16 when the Act was committed and no complaint has been made within 12 months of it, there has not been a crime committed. So I was declared not guilty, something that the media chose not to report. This acquittal is very disturbing. It indicates that the police might have been deliberately lowering ages. I strongly suggest that all the other charges be dropped by the prosecution. Absolutely, me lad. Me absolutely gorgeous, me lad. We abandon all the other false claims. So I can sentence him, lift the contempt of court order so the media can have a field day and make sure I appear strict and conservative. And the Alice in Wonderland insanity continued. Follow me, as they always said. I can see the white rabbit ahead. Rapidly checking his watch. Fantasy, insanity. This tunnel is long and hard to take. In the dark I feel this lady has made a mistake. Drink me, says the bottle, eat me, says the cake. The Mad Hatter's tea party is back. The courts of justice are cards out of the pack. Trust in me, I'm not easily led. What will be is not easily read. Suddenly, Tweedledum, Tweedledee, lunacy.
field day. We had been furious when the judge had banned all coverage of the trial because of subsequent ones coming up. We love the daily drip, drip, drip of poison. It absolutely ruins a reputation. And of course we couldn't do that. So we were so frustrated. But when he eventually lifted the ban, we had a field day. We went to town and we splashed King all over the front pages. We bought up victim interviews. We always print at the end of an interview the obligatory disclaimer. A fee for this interview has been donated to a charity of the choice of the interviewee. Whereas in fact we don't reveal that a much larger sum covers their expenses. Sometimes 20 times the sum we give to the charity. We really put the boot in. Magic. Since I've been in prison two months, uh, I've made many friends amongst inmates and officers and governors, and the reaction to all the negative publicity was actually hugely supportive, with everybody clapping me on the back and, uh, and generally cheering. When I got back from the Old Bailey after I was sentenced, uh, and I went upstairs to refresh myself and came down the stairs in my special gown that I've had shipped in, the entire wing applauded and cheered me and said I looked like Noel Coward in the Italian job. And after a dreadful Channel 4 documentary that was shown terribly late at night at midnight, uh, which I finished off by saying something like, don't let the bastards get you down, I had a Shawshank Redemption moment when the entire prison cheered and banged on their doors with their metal cups and shouted to the sky. I actually felt quite tearful, made me feel very, very wanted. Social commentators covered the event by likening King to me, Oscar Wilde. A hundred years ago, social homophobia had locked me up and ruined my life and career, all done with joy. Joy rhymes with boy. Mind you, 400 years before the birth of Christ, Socrates had been put to death for corrupting the youth. Plato described it as the end of our friend, the best, wisest and finest human being I have ever known. Now, two days before the courts of Europe had forced homophobic Great Britain to equalise the ages of consent, King was arrested. A subtle government message, or perhaps one aimed at tabloid readers in the country. Within a few years, the age of consent for homosexual acts had gone from none at all to 21 to 18 to 16. Even though it makes sense for males to be considered as able to decide who they want to make love to as females, the government have decided the public do not agree with this. Morals change over the years and it's very dangerous to enforce current laws for behaviour that might or might not have taken place many years ago. The only explanation is a very nasty one. How can somebody be old enough to consent to killing someone and be sent to prison for it when they are considered not old enough to be able to consent to have sex with someone? Despite the apparent relaxing of the law over 40 years, those in charge seem determined to condemn same gender sexuality. Surely, if two people are old enough to know who they love, and both consent to love somebody, and both want to love somebody, there's nothing wrong with it. You've got to have consent Clear understanding what is meant
Everyone always says it was never their intention to offend anyone. We proudly admit that it was, is and remains our complete intention. We could have delivered a song called There's Nothing Wrong With Making Love To Girls. I loved life in prison. It uh, taught me a couple of things I've been sadly lacking before, patience and tolerance. I find I was much more useful reading uh, very sad, lonely people who couldn't read or write letters from their wives while tears ran pouring down their cheeks than I'd felt when I was crooning Una Paloma Blanca to millions. As I've said then and I repeat now, I'm not and I never have been a sex offender. I am and I've always been a sex defender. Sex is fantastic as long as both people want to do it and are enjoying themselves. Rather as I expected, my first appeal was turned down. We reject your appeal. The ground that it was impossible to prove that you didn't do something over a quarter of a century earlier is ludicrous. The sentence being twice as long as the guidelines was actually quite fair. You abused a position of trust. The guidelines are for people like parents and teachers and relatives and coaches and priests. We chose to ignore your opinion that these are in a far greater position of trust than a pop star and a TV personality. As any tabloid reader will confirm, travelling miles on a train to visit someone associated with sex, drugs and rock and roll involves far greater trust. We reject your absurd claim that it would have been quite possible for these men to have decided not to visit you. They and their parents read the red tops. They say you were a star. What greater position of trust could there be than that? I failed to mention to the court that I'd known you in the early 60s, when a mutual friend of ours, Keith Glennie, had brought me round to your digs and you'd rubbed me off a couple of times. I was a sporty type around then, known as a rucker-bucker, very appropriate, and your proclivities were quite plain and you made them very open, and I was only too happy to come round for a little light relief. Sometimes we do things and love them when we're young and sexually desperate, then we get older and become establishment family men and we look back at those days and prefer to forget them or wish they'd never happened or pretend we didn't want them at the time. As it happened, karma kicked in and the Grim Reaper popped round and rubbed me off himself a couple of months after your appeal. You forgot you'd ever met me until you read my obituary in the Times. I had thousands of letters in Belmarsh Jail after all the publicity after my conviction, mainly supportive and positive. The brain dead tend to find writing exhausting. One was very strange. It seemed to be written almost on parchment with a quill pen and ink. And she, I don't know why, but I assumed the anonymous scribe was female. She said in her letter that I was a fine, decent and upstanding man and would not suffer at all from this dreadful miscarriage of justice, but that those involved in my case would indeed suffer. And she went on to detail certain things. She said two of the jurors in my trial had already died and one would die within months. This was only a few weeks after my trial. She also said that... Uh, Two of the judges involved in my trial would uh, die prematurely. Now, I thought this was ridiculous. She said one of them I'd already met years ago and I'd known him for 40 years. I thought, well, this is mad. There was only one judge in my trial. And I didn't know any others anyway. But what actually then happened was a few months later, uh, the judge that sat on my appeal died of a heart attack out of the blue aged 60 and I discovered on reading his obituary that he had indeed been at Cambridge with me and I had known him 40 years earlier and the other thing that came out of the blue was the recorder of London died at a dinner party aged only 50 and to my astonishment I realised that he had actually sat in the legal arguments before my trial and had allocated my trial to the trial judge so an awful lot of her predictions actually came true one of the other things she said was that somebody who was not directly involved in my case but who had encouraged others for financial gain would shortly lose a loved one. A few months after King's trial my wife was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Fortunately shortly after her death I met another man's wife and was able to install her as my live-in companion. Karma never beats Waxy Maxi. 
I'm getting to rather enjoy these old shows on Gold TV, Top of the Pops, No Limit, Entertainment USA, Ready Steady Go, Thank You Lucky Stars, Entertainment World. from compensation and media fees so far, even though you weren't in any of the trials and all your claims were ordered abandoned, but now we can really cash in. Waxy Maxi's organised a highly paid confrontation stunt for one of the tabloids. I'm a bit nervous about it because of course King and I have never actually met, but I suppose I can bluster. Flame Mitchell's told me whatever you do, don't let go of his hand. That gives him lots of photo opportunity time. This world of victim empathy is brilliant, isn't it? The money we've made, the sympathy we've got, nobody ever used to like you before. Except you. But now everyone treats you with kindness and affection, all because of something that never happened. What a clever trick. I'm surprised more people don't do it. Perhaps they do, dear. Perhaps they do. After several months of freedom, King managed to find out, with the help of friends who visited his apartment in New York, that he had a cast-iron alibi that he had actually been in America during the new, later time frame of one of the convictions. This, amongst other various reasons that he claims made an unfair trial, are still going through the process of appeal. But don't hold your breath. And remember that when King's trial started on the 11th of September 2001, there were other things going on at the same time. When he said to his lawyers, how on earth can anybody be expected to concentrate on minor events such as wanking somebody off 30 years ago with all this happening, they roared with laughter and said, Mr King, British justice is not affected by minor global events. Someone's dropped a bomb somewhere Contaminating atmosphere and blackening the sky It's good news week Someone's found a way to give the rotting dead a will To live, go on and never die Have you heard the news? What did it say? Who's won that race? What's the weather like today? It's good news week Famines shake the need for coal by stimulating birth control We're wanting less to eat It's good news week Doctors finding many ways of wrapping brains in metal trays to keep us from the heat Osama bin Laden, circumcised or uncircumcised? Saddam Hussein, circumcised 
Oh, forget it. You've got the point. I was given first parole halfway through my sentence, which is almost unheard of for sex offenders, especially one who continues to maintain his innocence and had therefore not done any of the courses. My favourite moment came when the probation officer who was talking to me uh, asked about what I would be doing at home and I said I was going to install a CCTV unit with a fixed hard drive sealed so that I re could record every movement of everybody who came and left my house. She couldn't understand why I was doing that. I said, well, then I could actually have proof that I didn't do something if somebody accused me of something. This clearly muddled her like mad because she'd been taught, like most probation officers, that everyone who's in prison is guilty and could not work out why a guilty man would want evidence of any future crimes he might commit. She just couldn't understand I wasn't guilty and I wanted evidence that I hadn't committed a crime. Anyway, so I was due out and I decided to come out in a blaze of glory because if I was going to be called a vile pervert in all the media and all the tabloids, I might as well be a vile pervert on page one than a vile pervert buried away, hidden on page 36. I got friends to put together a CD single so I could say it was released the same day I was. The media could not resist such a stunt. One of the tabloids ran a campaign called Don't Give King a Thing with a nice logo listing all my available tracks and projects in detail. Sales exploded. It took them several weeks to work out that I was deliberately and intentionally provoking negative coverage. The editors couldn't understand it, but I'd done it all through my career. I got over 18,000 letters in one day when I chose to criticise Band-Aid back in 1985. Don't knock charity. You can justify almost any behaviour by constantly mentioning your generosity, especially if it involves children, preferably starving ones. When there's a gap between image and reality, if you know you have a talent disparity, when Tourette's gets confused with insanity, find yourself a vanity charity. They've done it for years in the world of variety, covered their creative holes with piety, used the love of hypocrisy by society. Do you really care? Spice up the platitudes with obscenity Solve all the problems by saying what's meant to be You can abscond with the deal of the century Just by convincing the world of sincerity Go for the battered wife or a child The starving but distant will drive tabloid wild If a life was extinguished every time that you smiled Do you really care? To deflect our consciences and grant absolution If a million still die in the media confusion Do we really care? about hypocrisy. It's the great British quality. We publish stories condemning nudity alongside pictures of ladies 
with no clothes on. We're only here to make lots and lots of money, which some would say is the root of all evil. That's all very well, but the law is the law and it's there to be bent. The amount of time I've spent in filthy public toilets and watching ghastly, appalling pornography, I've got repetitive strain injury in my right wrist. Our job is to lock people up whilst being very, very polite and offering them tea or coffee with milk or sugar. We love writing stories about people in prison. They've lost all their good character anyway. So even if they were to sue and win, the judge would only award them a pound in damages. So we just make the stories up and publish them. There's nothing they can do about it. We wanted to set up a story of a young boy asking King directions in the street and printing the photograph saying, here he is at it again, but our lawyers wouldn't let us use a minor unless it was Arthur Scargill. So we took some photographs of King in a deck chair by the Serpentine when he was being interviewed for a TV programme and we used Photoshop to put a family in the background with a young lad walking past and we printed it as pervert in the park and the story was there was king ogling a young lad in the park again it was rubbish of course but it made a great story i bet you hate the tabloids jonathan not at all they have paid me handsomely over the years and have always been deliciously and totally predictable no it's the police and the CPS and the judiciary who claim never ever to read the tabloids or do anything that the tabloids or the media say and then actually obey every single thing they ask them to do that drive me crazy. Never read them myself. We suffocate truth with words and boredom. Anyone who's ever attended court knows that the stifling dullness of detail and bloody archbold are enough to condemn the most innocent defendant to lose the will to live. The real sound of justice is a yawn. There are still a few brave people who dare to stand up and champion the oppressed, like the strangely named Shami Chakrabarti. One thing is certain, nobody could ever write a song about Shami Chakrabarti. She should be running the country at the head of a party, Shami Chakrabarti. She should be running the country at the head of a party, Shami Chakrabarti. She should be running the country at the head of a party, Shami Chakrabarti. Just realise that everybody you ever loved will find out what you really got up to when they die. So you better behave yourself. King has a clear conscience on that level. And incidentally, Karma says that you will be reborn as the person you most despised in your past life. So if you are a homophobic, sexist, racist, fascist man, you'll be reborn as a gay black liberal woman. Well, we can't complain. We've made a fortune. You've become a counsellor to loads and loads of genuine abuse victims and they don't even know you made yours up entirely. You've even become quite famous. 
Mm. Though some would say karma did kick in, I suppose. Mm. See you. Ah. T. Karma? Crap. King's friend stood as a £50,000 bail bond for him and when the man came up with a TV format, King told him to use me as public relations man and manager. As he said, whilst I was the nastiest and the most immoral, I was also the best in the business. I've made millions taking a hefty chunk of the profits from his ghastly series of global reality talent TV shows. <laughs> It was a hot July day in heaven And the sky was blue below All the citizens of paradise were attending The celestial millennium talent show Last time they had witnessed a real surprise When the architect of Petra had won instead Of the favourite the Egyptian sculptor Toothmores For his bust of Nefertiti's head Chaucer was there for the Canterbury Tales With the creator of Sydney's Opera House sales King Lear was a contender as was Bleak House And the man who designed the computer, Matt Mouse Aristotle got there late, he had trouble parking And sat down between Lowry and Philip Larkin Picasso spoke to Rubens, Sophocles with his mum But Dr Viagra sadly couldn't come A hush fell and God announced the two finalists The Death of the Virgin by Caravaggio And the Statue of David by Michelangelo there was the expected uproar and the odd supportive cheer Jean Genet walked out pale, shaken and feeling a little queer Rachmaninoff hissed to Beethoven The judges must be deaf or dead And Beethoven was heard to reply What was that you said? Several felt they should have chosen Eros Gateway Arch And the stuffed shirts favoured the man who'd invented starch The Scots champion TV and John Logie Baird Whilst others whispered softly, thank God we were spared The Orientals considered Hokusai's great wave very good But Van Gogh felt a chair was the better use of wood The statue of David won, of course, by a mile Though Da Vinci felt he deserved it for that smile When Caravaggio met Michelangelo At the Celestial Millennium Talent Show A very successful event, that Celestial Millennium Talent Show. I'm looking forward to the literary event when both the Bible and the Koran lose out to an Agatha Christie novel. Don't underestimate karma, Maxie. It has a habit of lurking in the corner of a room and coming out when you're least expecting it and biting you on the bottom. So, did the experience ruin King's life like it ruined Oscar Wilde's? No, actually, it enriched it. He's spending his life now battling against all the many miscarriages of justice that happen in the entire global world justice system. So karma can sometimes have a very good effect. People ask me, why have I made this film? Is it to make viewers like me? No way, I hate being liked. But hopefully this film has entertained and made you laugh. Possibly you've enjoyed some of the music. And just perhaps you found some sympathy for those other poor victims of miscarriages of justice who don't have voices, resources, energy, imagination or evidence to prove their innocence. 
I have no regrets. I've loved every minute of my life and I wouldn't have changed a thing. The only thing that ever turned me on sexually is if the other person is turned on, which is absolutely perfect. I've even become quite fond of being called a vile pervert. A friend was visiting me in prison and there'd just been a dreadful tabloid story about me calling me a vile pervert. And I said to him, I wish they wouldn't keep calling me a vile pervert. I'm not a vile pervert. And he said, yes, you are. You're just a very nice vile pervert. That'll do fine for me. <laughs> <laughs>